and many happy returns yet. It being uh, two o'clock, we we'll now move to question time and I'll call Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, how many funds subject to Labor's doubling of the super tax are self-managed super funds? Very good question. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Payne for the question. I'm not sure I have the exact number with me. I will come back to the Senate uh, with it, but as I've said a number of times uh, this week, we expect uh, the very modest change that we have made, that we have announced in relation to um, lowering the concessional rate um, for, for tax concessions for balances over three million, will affect around 80,000 individuals. When it, is, when it comes into effect, and of that, there is certainly a, a proportion of the, that which are self-managed super funds. I'll see if I can find the exact number for Senator Payne uh, during question time today. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Payne, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, can you categorically rule out any further changes by this government in this parliament to the taxation or regulation of self-managed super funds? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the government's made clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation uh, during this term, and this this change won't actually won't actually come into effect until after the next election, uh, which is something which is something those opposite who are dying in the ditch on on this issue uh, don't take into account. We have made a very modest change. A very modest change. I've already um, answered Minister the question, Gallagher, Senator Birmingham, please, if you were listening. Um, Minister Gallagher, please, please resume. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Uh, point of order on reference, and, uh, and I've been attempting to listen uh, carefully to Senator Gallagher and her uh, response to what is a prospective question about the government ruling out any further changes appears to be hinging on the change they are currently making, I invite you to draw Senator Gallagher to the question about the government clearly ruling out any further changes affecting self-managed superannuation funds. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I have been listening and I believe that the minister is being relevant and I'll invite her to continue. If you had listened, I had said very clearly if, 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 I, if you had listened, I said very clearly that the government has made it clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation arrangements that we are making this term, and this one, this one, won't come into effect until after the next election. We have been clear about that. This is a very modest change to a very small number of people who are fortunate enough to have three million dollars in their superannuation account. Thank you, Minister. Account. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Payne, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. So, Minister, having now broken Mr Albanese's election promise to not change taxes on superannuation and launched an assault targeted at self-managed superannuation funds, why should any Australian trust Labor not to further hike taxes or undermine choice in superannuation? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, we are upfront about the challenges we've inherited. We have made a very modest change, a very modest change to a small number of people with superannuation balances in excess of three million dollars. The average superannuation balance on International Women's Day in this country for women is a hundred and forty thousand dollars. A hundred and forty thousand dollars. Women retire with less savings Minister, in their super. Minister, they have less assets. They Minister earn Gallagher, less. Please resume and you your seat. Dying. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet on my left. Minister, please continue. I finished my um, so I'm just going to go to Senator Wong, who needs to advise of some ministerial arrangements. Min uh, Senator yes, Wong. I apologise. I was so taken away with saying happy birthday to Murray Coleman, I forgot to actually give the statement by leave concerning ministerial arrangements. So I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Leave's granted. Thank you. Leave is granted. I advised. <laughs> Uh, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements that, Sen and Sen that Senator Farrell will be absent from question time 
uh, today and tomorrow on account of ministerial business overseas and in his absence ministers will represent portfolios in accordance with a letter that has been circulated to president, the president, party leaders and independent senators. Thank you. Um Senator Wong. Just while we've got this break, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Mongolia, led by Mongolia's Minister for Education and Science, His, Excel His Excellency Inkam Galan, and the Ambassador of Mongolia to Australia, His Excellency Dava Seren, and the Mongolian delegation. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, the Senate. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. On International Women's Day, we look at how far we've come and where we're heading. Can the Minister outline what's next on the Albanese government's agenda for women? Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question and for her long-standing uh, work in supporting um, women, particularly those on low incomes um, in this country over many, many years. And I would, on International Women's Day, also like to associate myself with the other uh, comments and remarks made about Mari Coleman, who I acknowledge in the chamber today, who um, seems to have been a mentor and someone many of us have looked up to in this place. And it's a real privilege for me uh, to, to be here as Minister for Women in a government that's pursuing many of the issues that Mari and her, her colleagues um, have campaigned uh, for for many years. And this is a government that puts women at the centre. Um, I acknowledge all the women colleagues in this place and all the, the women parliamentarians who have come before us. Over the years, Australia has made great progress advancing the status of women, but in a number of areas, progress is slowing or stalled. This government is working hard to put us on the path to achieving a better future for women in Australia. We're developing a national strategy to achieve gender equality, to help make Australia one of the best countries in the world for equality between men and women. And this government is listening to women. We don't want to guess what life is like for women of all backgrounds. We want to know and listen and hear from them. Today we launched public consultation on the strategy, including a survey and other materials to support individuals, communities and organisations to contribute to that strategy. We want to hear from Australians from all walks of life, especially women and girls, about what it's like in the areas of care, work, economic security, safety, healthy, uh, health and beyond. We want this to be a national and respectful conversation, and today I've written to all my colleagues in this place to invite you to be part of this important national discussion in your electorates and in your communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline what the government has already achieved for women since being elected last May? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question. Uh, we've been delivering on our commitments we took to the last election um, since coming to government in May 2022 through policies like investments in our cheaper childcare, 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, boosting and expanding the par paid parental leave, gender responsive budgeting in the first budget in nearly a decade that cast a gendered lens over the budget, the national plan, signing off the national plan with states and territories to end violence against women and children with a record $1.7 billion dollars to implement the plan, supporting a wage increase for aged care workers, where over 90 per cent of workers are women. We've also, My colleague in the other place uh, has established a National Women's Health Advisory Council to improve our health system and how it responds to women and girls. We've got funding and legislation to implement all 55 re recommendations of the ex Respect at Work report, and we've introduced a bill to close the gender pay gap. Thank you, Minister. Our Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. We know that some women experience greater inequality. Can the Minister update us on how the government is ensuring no women are left behind? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Walsh for the supplementary. We know that some women face additional barriers that intersect with and compound their experience of gender inequality. The consultation launched today seeks feedback from all women. And we're committed to shining a light on where we need to improve and where we need uh, better data. The report card, which has also been released today, 
is a step forward in that. We would be doing that every year and we will be held to account and measuring our progress through that. We're working in partnership with First Nations communities to develop an action plan as well as a standalone First Nations plan on family violence. This will build on the $424 million in additional funding for the Closing the Gap implementation plan, which was committed last month. And there were also additional investments in the October budget directly to support First Nations people and First Nations women. And in shining a voice to parliament will help ensure that First Nations women's voices are raised and heard on the policies that affect them and their communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. How should Australian companies pay frank dividends during periods when they are raising capital under the government's franking reforms? Minister. The question on everyone's lips out there. This is another one that um, this is another one that the opposition are opposed to. We inherited a budget. We inherited a budget with a fifty billion dollar structural deficit, with pressures coming to us, a trillion dollars of Liberal Party debt, debt that had doubled before the uh, pandemic hit. This is the budget we inherited. And all of the very modest changes that we're doing, including closing some tax loopholes and protecting the integrity of the tax system hey, hey. through the changing, changes we're making to frank dividends, even that, even that you are opposed to, something that raises a very modest $200 million uh, when implemented. Again, the no alition with their head in the sand. They want they don't want to pay for anything. They don't want budget repair. They Order. don't want to fix the energy crisis. They don't want to support uh, energy power bill relief. They don't want to support housing for women. They don't uh, want Minister, to support Aussie please jobs. Your seat. Um, Senator Chandler. Um, President, the point of order is relevant. It was a very specific question. The minister has been responding for a minute and two seconds, and I would like her to be relevant to the question that I asked. Uh, thank you. The minister is being relevant, and I'll listen to make sure the rest of the question is answered. Senator Wong, did you, are you seeking oh, a You've point ruled, of... so I don't thank need you. to make um, Minister Gallagher. Well, the changes to franking dividends the, cha the changing to franking credits um, through uh, the off-market share buybacks uh, arrangement uh, and the capital raising measure, which you guys actually announced and never, never implemented, another Order. one, raise it, put it in there, never do it, uh, to ensure the integrity of the tax system and to close off loopholes. It's a reasonable, rational, measured response that assists very small with budget repair, with budget repair. Well, you you are opposed to it, okay? So we are we we will continue on without you. Two hundred million dollars it raises. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, this was quite a precise question with a direct uh, direct point made by Senator Chandler, asking about how Australian companies will pay franking dividends during periods they are raising capital. I would ask you to invite the minister, in the interest of direct relevance, to turn to the issue of companies raising capital under these reforms and how they are impacted. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Uh, well, the minister is actually discussing the very policy reform that Senator Chandler asked about. So I'd submit to you that is clearly directly relevant. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Order. Order. I do believe that uh, the minister is being relevant, um, so I'll I invite her to continue. Minister. Well, I've answered the question, and those I have. It's the off share, off market minister, share buyback arrangement. Seat. Please resume your seat. Along with Min your capital raising measure, it minister, minister, I've asked you to resume your seat. I'm asking for order, particularly on my left. Minister, please continue. Thank you. The measure will align off-market share buybacks with on-market share buybacks, which I think is a sensible, rational tax integrity measure that raises a very modest amount of revenue and assists Thank with you, budget the repair. Time has expired. Uh, Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How does the minister explain the wording in the explanatory memorandum attached to the franking credit reforms that, and I quote, 
If an entity has never previously made a distribution, then the entity will not have a practice of making distributions. Minister. Well, I haven't seen where, I haven't got the explanatory memorandum uh, before me, um, and I would wonder if I would want to see the context with which that was set. Like, I mean, you're opposed to the reform. You're trying to blow it into something that it isn't. I, no. And, well, I'll have a look at the explanatory memorandum and see the context with. with see the Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Minister, please continue. I'm happy to look at the explanatory memorandum. I don't have it before me right now, but I do support closing off a tax loophole. And, and ensuring the integrity of our taxation system, um, something that senators in this place used to have an interest in. But we don't expect any of that from the no coalition that are going to say no to everything, no to absolutely everything, including sensible budget repair measures. Uh, you were budget vandals when you were in government, and you're going to continue on with the vandalism from opposition. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. Uh, Senator Hume, I, Senator Hende, uh, Hume, I have a senator on her feet, and you are calling out. Uh, senator Hume, I'm not inviting you to answer and argue back. I'm simply calling you to order, Senator Chandler. There's no fun allowed. Thank you, here. thank you, President. <clears throat> Just like superannuation, Labor repeatedly promised not to make any changes to franking credits if they won government. The Prime Minister stated that, and again I quote, Labor has heard the message clearly and we will not be taking any changes to franking credits to the next election. Given Mr Albanese promised no changes to franking credits prior to the election and is now doing the opposite in government, why should any Australian like trust Labor to not to make further like to tax grabs on order? their savings order. or investments? Order. Call one side. Order. Uh, order. As Senator Hughes, I've called you to order. And Senator McGrath. Minister, please answer the question. Yes, thank you. Well, Senator Chandler's question is wrong. This change does not uh, involve any change to franking credits or dividend imputations, and you know it. You know it. But it doesn't suit your narrative. It doesn't suit your narrative. So now we know that you're opposed to everything. You're also opposed to Order. tax integrity. You're, imposed, you're opposed to closing off tax loopholes. We can add that to the list of things that you don't you don't agree with. So no to housing for women and children escaping domestic violence. No to uh, jobs in the manufacturing sector. No to energy power bill relief. And now, no to tax integrity and no to closing Order. off tax Minister, loopholes. What please. do you stand for? Minister, Absolutely please nothing. Your seat. Order on my right and left. Minister, please continue. I think I've finished. <laughs> Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, President. Can I first acknowledge it's International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to all. Um, and to Murray Coleman, who's no longer in the chamber, but whose presence um, is felt uh, and will be for many years. Uh, so today is International Women's Day, and we don't want cupcakes, we want equality. We want investment in women's safety, health and economic security. The government says it would love to do more if it wasn't Senator for a tight Waters, budget. Um, Senator Waters, you haven't addressed your question. You are so right. Maybe I needed to eat some of those cupcakes after all. <laughs> My question is to the minister representing herself, the Minister for Women, Minister Gallagher. Happy International Women's Day. The government says it would love to do more if it wasn't for a tight budget, yet you've refused to scrap the stage three tax cuts that would give the balance sheet an extra $254 billion. The women's safety sector has said that $1 billion a year is what's needed to meet demand for frontline services and so that no women or children have to be turned away when they seek help. Will the government commit to that level of funding to keep women safe? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Waters for the question and I acknowledge her, um, her work and interests in the area of women's policy over a number of years. 
Um, and in, specifically in response to the question she uh, raises with me, we are very conscious of the need to continue to invest in uh, the national plan to end violence against women and their children and the services and systems that support the implementation of those, that plan, including uh, for First Nations women uh, through their own uh, plan and action plan that sits a, a, a alongside of that. We are and we have, um, I think, since coming to government, um, put our money where our mouth is on that and made some investments in October. I'm working with the minister with responsibility for uh, ending violence against women and children or the minister with responsibility for women's safety and her assistant minister uh, to look at further measures that we can support uh, in the upcoming budget. Um, they are currently you know, being considered by government and we are aware of uh, the calls from the sector around the additional money that's required. And these are some of the difficult decisions that you know, I've been trying to, to school those opposite on about how we make room for the services and, and supports we need in areas like ending violence against women and children whilst they're arguing to maintain those um, high levels of concessionality for um, superannuation account holders with more than $3 million in it. I mean, these are the difficult choices before government. We're making those choices, but I can guarantee that we are continuing to focus on making sure that we can make an actual difference in the lives of women in this country, particularly vulnerable women and women who experience uh, violence as part of their family and, uh, and, um, and how we support you, children Minister. through the that as well. Thank you, Minister. has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Paying superannuation on paid parental leave would cost around $200 million. Why won't the government prioritise closing the superannuation pay gap rather than turbocharging inequality by giving rich white men more in tax handouts? Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And, uh, the Senator Waters raises a, a very important uh, issue, which is the inequity that exists in the superannuation system uh, for women. Um, we know that uh, women retire with less uh, money than men, considerably less money than men. We know that the average super balance for women in this country, I can see those who are so interested in super a second ago all of a sudden aren't interested anymore, is $140,000. Well, I mean, okay, okay, there we are. They're awake now. They're awake now. $140,000 that the average female super balance is in this country. We don't hear you shouting about that. Order. The reform. We would. Order. Sorry. On both sides of the we, chamber. We. Sorry. We will. We do. We've made it clear we want to pay PPL. Uh, super on PPL. And it's something Payne. that we are finding want to find room in the budget to do, and when we can afford it, we will do it. Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. Second supplementary. Thank you, President. Homelessness and housing insecurity are at crisis levels, and the fastest-growing cohort of people at risk of homelessness is women over the age of 45. It's not over 55 anymore. It's over 45 post-COVID. How many new affordable homes could be built with the $254 billion that you're intending in giving in tax cuts to rich white men? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, um, we agree that accommodation and, and a greater supply of a social and affordable and crisis housing actually is required to address uh, the needs of women across the country. Um, we are negotiating with the states and territories under a new homelessness and housing agreement that's being led by. Um, Julie Collins, and we're in from the other place, and we are also determined to get our Housing Australia Future Fund up. Um, that that fund, if established, would be an enduring and ongoing fund that allocates thousands, thirty thousand social and affordable housing, of which a proportion would be dedicated to Senator women, Rustin. including uh, women with children escaping violence. So I would urge people in this place, if they care about that, even if it's not exactly the model that they would choose to do, support it, because this is what we will use to get more housing on the ground for women in Thank those you, areas. Thank you, Senator Green. Thank you, President. 
My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Noting that today is International Women's Day, could the Minister update the Senate on the situation facing women and girls in Iran and Afghanistan? Minister Wong. Thank you, and I thank Senator Green for her question and for her uh, continued work not, uh, for equality at home and beyond our shores. The UN has described the status of women and girls in Iran as that of second-class citizens. Discrimination is entrenched in Iranian law and practice, but the women of Iran have not been cowed. Instead, these courageous women and girls and their allies have been at the front, forefront of protests, shouting women, life, freedom, and the Australian government stands with them. We have called out Iran for its systematic discrimination against women and girls, most recently at the Human Rights Council last week. We have imposed sanctions on Iranians and Iranian entities involved in the violent crackdown of protesters. We stand too with the women of Afghanistan, where women's rights have been going backwards under the Taliban. The UN has found that the Taliban's treatment of women and girls may even amount to a crime against humanity. Women have been banned from attending university and girls from secondary education. Their movements and access to employment have been restricted. Sexual and gender-based violence have increased. So Australia is supporting the United Nations to provide health facilities and professionals to deliver reproductive health, counselling and protection services to vulnerable Afghan women and children. And last year, we supported the World Food Programme to provide food assistance to over 12 million women and girls. And Australia and others have supported our partners to deliver life-saving health care, shelter, education, nutrition, protection and cash assistance. There are many places in the world where we need to continue to work uh, with the brave women and men who seek for, to improve the position of women and girls in societies where they are regrettably and sadly treated in these ways. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, could the minister update the Senate on progress toward gender equality globally? Minister Wong. Unfortunately, it's not just Iran and Afghanistan. Women are facing setbacks around the world. The World Economic Forum uh, has estimated that at the current rate of progress, it will take, wait for it, 132 years to, to reach full parity. 132 years on current trajectory for there to be full parity between men and women. And we also know that the crises of COVID-19, climate disruption and food shortages have hurt women and girls more. They have amplified existing inequalities, including gender equality. According to the WEF, we saw a generational loss of gains towards gender parity between 2020 and 21, a documented step backwards in rates of livelihoods and poverty. And Care Australia has estimated that 150 million more women than men are affected by food insecurity. We've seen documented declines in leadership Thank you, Senator and representation. Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, what is the Albanese government doing to address global gender inequality and improve outcomes for women and girls? Minister. Uh, the developments I have outlined are troubling, I, I think, to everyone in this chamber, and they remind us how much work there is to be done. But the Albanese government is acting. In our development program, we, are, we have reinstated a performance target requiring 80 per cent of Australia's investments effectively address, re requiring that 80 per cent of Australia's investments effectively address gender equality in implementation. Uh, we have also introduced a mandatory requirement that our ODA investments over $3 million have a gender equality objective. And in 2022-23, we will pro provide $65 million through the Gender Equality Fund to respond to the needs, interests and rights of diverse women and girls, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. We have a steadfast commitment to advancing gender equality and the human rights of women and girls at home, in our region and globally. As I've said before, we take the world as it is, but we have to work to shape it for the better. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Does the Albanese government support the establishment 
of a sovereign, independent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nation in Australia? Yes or no? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. The, I think, I, think I'm, I, I understand the motivation behind Senator Hanson's question. Uh, and you will know, of course, that uh, the issue of sovereignty is something that uh, First Nations people, including in this place, have asserted very clearly. Uh, and you, you would have heard Senator Stewart and others talk about uh, um, the, the First Nations not having ceded their sovereignty. But if the question goes to two nations, uh, we, are, we, are, we are the nation of Australia. Uh, and what we seek to do uh, through the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, Voice, Treaty and Truth, uh, is to deal with the reality of our past, uh, to reconcile and to move forward together uh, through those three processes, mechanisms, reforms, a voice first, uh, but also treaty and, and, and Makarata. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Well, on that one, I don't feel I've really got an answer whether it was a yes or a no. I understand what you're saying about the um, Uluru Statement. Does the Albanese government consider that all Australians, regardless of race, share sovereignty over Australia and its territories, <laughs> yes or no? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. With, with respect, Senator Hanson, I understand the motivation behind that question. And, uh, uh, I would uh, say to you, I think that, that, that the way that's phrased uh, is a question that seeks to divide us. Uh, you, know, you and I both know uh, we are all Australian citizens, uh, but we do have unfinished business when it comes to our First Nations people. Uh, uh, we do have uh, a road that we have to walk as a country to bring us together, uh, and I don't believe uh, that road can be walked in good faith uh, if we if we start to try and divide people in the way that I, I think your question is seeking to do, Senator. Now, you're entitled to your views, uh, but what I would say to you is that we are all Australian citizens. Some of us come. We are all Australian. Order, Senator Thorpe. We are all Australian citizens, uh, but uh, there are uh, there is work that needs to be done to recognise the place of our First Nations people. Uh, in our but constitution thank you, Minister. and the time in our for society. answering has expired senator hansen second supplementary senator wong i have never been trying to i've never tried to um, segregate or divide this nation i've only called question, for equality ever senator since hansen, i came into parliament question. my question is does the albanese government support the principle that joke. all australians should be equally supported according to need not race yes or no Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Hanson, uh, I think uh, in order to ensure equality that governments need to recognise that some people have not and are not treated equally in great part because of their race. And you only need to look at the history of our First Nations people to recognise that. So yes, sometimes equality does require uh, that we recognise the way in which Race has impacted upon the equality of some of our peoples, and I do not think that is a bad thing. I think that is a, that is, uh, a, um, a principle of inclusion, not of separation and not of discrimination, but a principle of inclusion, acceptance and respect. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Um, National Transport Commission data shows our truck user would pay an additional $2.6 billion in taxes and charges over three years under the proposed consider considered by Transport Minister Catherine King. Everything Australians grow on farm or they make in a factory or they buy in a shop has to travel by truck. So will these extra taxes and charges add to inflation and make a difficult inflationary situation even worse? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Gallagher. I think uh, Senator Davey is talking about the heavy vehicle road user charges. Is that correct? Yep. 
Um, so any decision to increase heavy vehicle charges is a collective decision of all state and territory governments, and no decision has been taken yet. Um, those charges are intended to recover the heavy vehicle share of road expenditure by all governments, and the principle that heavy vehicle operators should continue their share towards the cost of roads is shared by government and industry. At the previous infrastructure and transport ministers' meetings, ministers agreed in principle across all governments to a three-year charging cycle following calls from industry for longer-term certainty, but no final decision has been reached on these charges. In response to um, the specifics of the question as it relates uh, to the Treasury portfolio as opposed to the infrastructure and transport portfolio. Um, the senator asked whether these, any increase in these charges, of which a decision hasn't been made, would uh, have an effect on inflation. I mean that is um, one of the reasons why we have an economic plan, uh, which is designed to ensure that government, through our revenue and expenditure, is not adding to inflation in the economy. But these aren't not determined. Inflation is not determined by one charge um, in one part of the economy. Uh, it's uh, the entire budget response uh, that this government will be cautious and careful about because we do not want to make the inflation challenge, which is real in this country and which is hurting households, stay around for any longer um, than is necessary to bring it back into the target rate and back into um, a more normalised setting. Um, and that is exactly why we want to concentrate on our economic plan to thank ensure you, that the we're doing what we need to do. Expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. I, I think I need to be a bit more specific. Um, has the government received any advice from the departments of finance or treasury as to the inflationary impact of Labor's proposed trucky taxes? and whether they could add further pressure for even higher increases on interest rate, and if so, what is that advice? Minister. Well, as I said, this is not Labor's charge, if you want to call it that way. This is something that's negotiated across governments uh, at the state and territory levels, of which I think there still is some Liberal governments in, right in power. Um, so I think it's disingenuous, as is your entire question time attack, really, about. Um, well, it is, it is, because because you can't because you can't actually go you can't actually argue on the merits. So you Order. try and you try and dress it up Order. into something that it's not. You try Order. and dress it up into something that it's not. No decision has been taken as to what advice as to what advice Treasury and Finance provide. Um, I'm not going to go into advice. I, I can certainly say I have not been provided. Thank you. Uh, Order. I have not. Uh, I'm not aware of. Um, you, you are Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Um, Senator Davies, second supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister, given the potential impact on increasing trucky taxes on transporters and, more importantly, consumers and their grocery bills and national inflation, will the government rule out increasing taxes on Australian truckies or will this become another one of Mr Albanese's broken promises, of which the number is mounting? Uh, thank you, yeah. Senator Davey. Minister Gallagher. I should see if Senator McGrath would like to answer this on, on my behalf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Order. Have a go. Have Order. a crack. Have a crack. Order. You must be so proud of yourself on International Women's Day. Order. Such a champion. Such a champion. Order. Good on you. Well done. Opposition life is hard. Minister it's Gallagher. Hard. Minister it's Gallagher, hard, James. please resume your seat. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Davey. Point of order, relevance. Uh, my question had nothing uh, to do with senator International Davey. Women's Day, and I'd like her to stick to the question. Senator Davey, the minister has just started and she is being relevant. I am more interested at this point. Order in there being order across the chamber so that I might hear the rest of her answer. 
Minister. Oh. Well, as the Senator knows, this is a matter uh, that's actually um, at the decision-making table of inf infrastructure and transport ministers who have not made a decision. It is across government, state and territory governments, involved in discussions uh, with the Commonwealth. So I think it's appropriately resolved at that level, and perhaps you could lobby your colleagues, if you're so concerned about it, about the position they might be taking. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the Attorney General. This week, Senator Dodson, a former commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, has called out your government, his own government, over its inaction on implementing the recommendations put forward by the Royal Commission over 30 years ago. Can you tell me if the government is going to ensure full implementation of all 339 of the recommendations? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe, for your question. Uh, I agree, and I would like to think that everyone in this chamber would agree with Senator Dodson uh, that 32 years after the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, that rates of incarcerated First Nations adults and youth are unacceptable, uh, and that the uh, rates of uh, deaths in custody among First Nations adults and youth are unacceptable. Uh, there are many members of our government. Uh, and across the chamber, who have said before and will, I'm sure, keep saying that First Nations incarceration rates and deaths in custody are a national shame. Uh, and coming into government, it was clear, unfortunately, that for the last nine years, First Nations justice was just not a priority for the former government. Uh, and that's why last year the Attorney General worked closely with his colleague, uh, Ms. Burney, to form a First Nations justice task force with officials from the Attorney General's Department and the National Indigenous Australians uh, Agency. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Thorpe, um, I'd in future wait to be noticed rather than calling out. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I've called you to order. It's not okay to argue back. Okay. Point you have a point of order? Thank you. Thank you. On relevance. Thank you. The minister is being relevant uh, to your question, so please resume your seat. Minister, please continue. Senator Thorpe, I've asked you to resume your seat. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, as, as I was saying— uh, Minister, please <laughs> resume your seat. Minister— Relevance. The question is when are you going to implement uh, the recommendations you, in full? Uh, Senator Thorpe, I did on your first point, say that the minister was being irrelevant, and I'm going to say on your second point the minister is being relevant. Pre Senator Pre Birmingham. Pre President, on, on the point of order and the handling of points of order, this is a seemingly new practice to rule before a senator has even had a chance to put their case. On Senator Thorpe's first point of order, she had no more than got the word relevance out of her mouth than you ruled against her without hearing the basis upon which she was claiming a relevancy of the answer. I would, President, invite you to reflect upon that and to consider in terms of your handling of points of order that I understand where they are repetitious uh, or, um, um, or take approaches uh, that are disorderly in the chamber, uh, but in this case, a first point of order from a senator on a question I think deserves the opportunity for that senator uh, who had the chance you, to make Birmingham. their point. Um, senator Wong, I'm going to respond and then I'll come to you. Um, senator Birmingham, as I've pointed out many times on points of order, I have senators stand and make statements and repeat questions and go to great lengths, which is unnecessary. Uh, in Senator Thorpe's case, and my apologies if she hadn't finished her answer, I understood she had finished her answer, and so I ruled. I'm going to go to Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, uh, oh. Order. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I un if I could uh, perhaps be uh, make make a couple of points um, in relation to your ruling. The first is, in fact, it was Senator Ryan who first started to truncate the submissions on points of order because his view was that a number of us, and you know, I may have been one of those. Um, made too many contributions on our feed on, on points of order. So uh, I, I was cut off on a number of occasions by, by Senator Ryan in the, as, as the president. Uh, um, 
being of the view that um, he had already come to a view about the, the substance of the point of order. I have to say, Senator, I, I thought you were saying the word and then sitting down. So we, we have no objection if the president wishes to call you to make your submission, if you wish to do that. Uh, Senator Thorpe, on your first point of order, if you hadn't finished, I, I invite you to make a short statement about your point of order. My point of order, thank you for the indulgence, President. My point of order was based on relevance because the question was relating to uh, if the government is going to implement 339 recommendations that will save black lives today. Yep. Thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. And you went to uh, statements that Senator Dodson had made and in general about the Royal Commission and uh, other matters. So I do believe the minister was being relevant. I'm going to invite him to continue. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And as I was saying last year, uh, in recognition that there is still more work to do in implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the Attorney General uh, established a First Nations Justice Task Force with uh, the Minister for uh, Indigenous Affairs, Ms Burney, um, and that contains officials from both of their agencies. And that task force is leading the design, coordination and implementation of this government's historic $99 million First Nations justice package. Um, that includes unprecedented Commonwealth investment in justice reinvestment, unprecedented Commonwealth investment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services to provide culturally appropriate legal assistance in coronial inquiries, and a commitment to real-time reporting of deaths in custody. The government is also working closely with states and territories on a proposal to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility. So we acknowledge there's more to work to be done in this space. It needs to happen, and we're Thank getting on you, with it. Thank you, Minister. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Uh, what will your government do to support your own special envoy? the father of reconciliation on taking urgent action on the implementation of the recommendations. And what time frame are you operating under, given it's been over 30 years already? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe, and thank you to, for drawing attention to someone that I know we are all extremely proud to have within our ranks, uh, Senator Dodson not just the father of reconciliation, but of course a commissioner in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, in fact, I think on a personal level, that's probably where I first became aware of Senator Dodson's incredible advocacy uh, on behalf of our First Peoples. Uh, Senator Dodson has been a lifelong advocate for and a leader amongst First Nations Australians. Uh, and I know that he's making Senator a very Thorpe. strong contribution as a member of the Albanese government uh, to deliver on those recommendations and to improve the position of First Nations people in our country every single day. Now, Senator Dodson, I've, I've, I've uh, come to regard as a friend. I've learned a lot from him, and I know that he's someone of incredible goodwill and, has, and puts the, the, uh, uh, the, the needs and rights of First Nations people at the centre of what he does every single day. We can all learn from him and we can all take up his call to do more in this area. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Thorpe, are you ready to ask a second supplementary? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Thank you, President. One of the key factors impacting deaths in custody in access to healthcare in prisons by making Medicare in prisons available, First Nations people could access Aboriginal health checks and culturally safe health care. Years ago, Labor made a policy commitment to Medicare in prisons. When are you going to make this a reality? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, well, of course, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Well, of course, our government is doing everything we possibly can to rebuild Medicare after years of destruction, whether that be in the general community or in prisons. Um, we have been on the record on many occasions saying that after nearly 10 years of Liberal National Party government, Medicare is broken. Uh, and that applies whether we're talking about people seeking to go to a GP in their community or whether we're talking about in prisons as well. Um, that they, these are important issues to make sure uh, that all prisoners, and in particular First Nations prisoners, are given the unacceptable high, high, unacceptably high rates 
of both incarceration uh, and deaths in custody get the health treatment that they deserve. And I have every confidence uh, that through the leadership of people like Senator Dodson, Senator McCarthy, Ms Burney, Ms Scrimgeour and many others, that this government will be doing more in this space than any we uh, government we've ever seen. Uh, thank you, Senator Watts. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Watt. What is the Australian government doing to transform Australian industry, and why is it important to improve Australia's sovereign capability? Great uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator O'Neill, who I know is a very strong supporter of the manufacturing industry, particularly in her state of New South Wales. A key commitment that the Albanese government made at the election was to rebuild Australian manufacturing. After 10 years of neglect and turning its, uh, our back on manufacturing under the former government, the Albanese government committed to build a future made in Australia, and the National Reconstruction Fund is a key part of doing that. The National Reconstruction Fund will provide finance to co-invest with industry, to drive investments to grow advanced manufacturing and support businesses to innovate and create more good blue-collar jobs right across our country. The National Reconstruction Fund will also leverage Australia's natural and competitive strengths and shore up our supply chains. We saw through the pandemic how our supply chains were under huge pressure. Products we expected were hard to get. Across a range of products, our supermarkets and pharmacies couldn't get us what we needed. Order we couldn't get ventilators, we couldn't get PPE, and who can forget going to supermarkets with those empty shelves when we couldn't get the products that we needed? Now, that was when some of us took note of the fact that our manufacturing industry had been run down as a country, and some of us took note that we need to be able to stand on our own two feet and make more things here. And that's when the seed for the National Reconstruction Fund was planted. We know you hate manufacturing. We know you sent the car industry offshore. We know you don't like manufacturing jobs, but you finally have a chance to repent and get behind the National Reconstruction Fund. The Albanese government, Labor government is committed to building resilient supply chains and national sovereign capability to reinforce the prosperity, security and well-being of the nation. The National Reconstruction Fund will attract investment, it will help to grow the Australian economy and, most importantly, it will deliver good quality manufacturing jobs across our country. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. Minister, how will the National Reconstruction Fund support manufacturing businesses and create manufacturing jobs, particularly in regional Australia? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Uh, Minister Watt. Thanks again, uh, Senator O'Neill. When we think about manufacturing, we think about regional Australia. Places like Gladstone, the Hunter Valley, Wyala, Geelong, Bell Bay and so much of Western Australia. Some of us get off the North Shore every now and then, Senator, Senator Hughes, and some of us get out into regional Australia and see what's going on in the manufacturing industry. And that's because regional Australia is a manufacturing powerhouse, and the National Reconstruction Fund will make our regions even stronger. A number of the National Reconstruction Fund priority uh, areas. Senator oh, Watt. we're back in the North Shore. Senator Watt, order, order. Uh, Senator Hughes, I haven't called you yet. Order, order. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Hughes. Uh, I would like to ask Senator Watt to withdraw the uh, commentary that he's making in deriding the North Shore of Sydney, not oh, that I live Senator on the North Hughes. Shore of Sydney, and I have got off the North Senator Shore Hughes. of Sydney many times, Resume unlike you, seat. I lived in— Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Watt, I haven't called you either. I am going to remind you it's not appropriate to single out particular senators, and I'm going to ask you to direct your comments to the chair. Please continue. I withdraw. Uh, the, um, as I say, the National Reconstruction Fund priorities have a very strong regional presence, sectors like resources, agriculture, defence and renewables. And it's no wonder, therefore, uh, that so many industry groups with a large regional presence are backing the National Reconstruction Fund. To begin with, an organisation I've heard of called the National Farmers Federation, uh, who, when Labor announced uh, this, uh, this commitment, talked about the opportunities for a renaissance of regional manufacturing. I would encourage all senators, particularly a little group over there, Thank to maybe you, listen Senator to groups White, like the NFF. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. 
Thank you, Madam President. Are there, um, Minister, are there any threats to delivering this support for Australian manufacturers? Uh, Minister Watt. Well, Senator O'Neill, it is my melancholy duty to say that there are, there are threats to this proposal. Uh, and while the resources and agriculture, agriculture industry are saying yes, yes, yes to the National Reconstruction Fund, those opposite keep saying no, no, no. And these are industries that the National Party of all groups are supposed to be champions for in this place. And, and I note, uh, I take the interjection from Senator McKenzie that it's a coalition, and perhaps that suggests that maybe there's not full agreement between the Liberals and the Nationals on this point. That would be very interesting to explore. And, and I note that there, in the past, uh, National Senator Matt Canavan has acknowledged the past 20 years of federal governments, including his own, have dropped the ball on Australian manufacturing. Uh, he said that they've dropped the ball, but there's been a real renaissance in manufacturing in Australia. Well, Senator Canavan and all the Nationals, I invite you to join with us. I invite you to join with us with the National Farmers Federation, with the Australian Al Aluminium Council to get behind regional manufacturing. There's an opportunity to stand up to the North Shore Thank Liberals you, and back Your regional time Australia. Has expired. Senator Little. Thank you, President. Now, this question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Minister, your government went to the election with a promise to prioritise Australians' access to health care and reduce the cost of medicines. Given this promise, why has the Albanese Labor government decided to remove an innovative, life-changing form of insulin, FIASP, from the PBS, sending the price soaring to unaffordable levels for 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on it. Uh, thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Little uh, for the question. Uh, and uh, Senator Little is right in her, um, in her question about our commitments to improving access to health care and improving Medicare, improving the cri or dealing with the crisis in primary care. It's another one of those issues that was left to us after 10 years of neglect and dysfunction from those opposite, that it was harder to see a doctor and more expensive to access health care. And we are doing everything we can to reduce the price of, uh, of medicines. In fact, our change that came in on the 1st of January has in, uh, reduced the price of most pharmaceuticals from $42 a script Senator to $30 a script. In relation to uh, the um, insulin medication that Senator Little um, has, has raised, um, this was a, a decision of PBAC, which is an independent expert body which advises the Australian government about the listings of medicine and comprises experts in the field of medicine, health, economics, social policy, health technology and pharmacology. Uh, the health minister was made aware on the 22nd of February of the company's intention to delist this medication from PBS from the 1st of April. Uh, we understand that this is causing concern for people who Senator Rustin. This, we understand that this is causing concern for people who are using that, uh, let, that medication. And the minister has asked his department to work with the company to look at uh, resol resolving the matter. The PBAC has advised that due to the, unavailable, to the availability of other medicines, the removal of this particular medication from PBS will not result in unmet clinical need. Um, Thank you, need. Minister. The time for answering this question has expired. Senator Little, first supplementary. Thank you. Senator Minister. Rustin, just a moment, Senator Little. You've got one of your own senators on her feet ready to ask a question. Senator Little, please continue. Thank you. Minister, your government went to the election with a promise to prioritise Australians' access to health care and make it easier to see a doctor, which is particularly important for rural, regional and remote Australians. Given that promise, why has the Albanese Labor government ripped GPs out of rural, regional and remote Australia by changing the distribution priority areas for overseas trained doctors, making it harder for millions of Australians in those areas to see a doctor? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Well, uh, with, with respect, Senator Little's question is, is not correct to say that Labor has ripped GPs out of areas. That is just simply, it is simply not true. And honestly, to have the interjections, I, 
from uh, Senator Rustin, who was a member of the ERC that sat there and watched while Medicare fell into crisis and areas like workforce uh, were not dealt with. Uh, while it took delays through the immigration system for health professionals to come here, that Senator we are Rustin. now fixing Senator and Rustin. cleaning up. The interjections are outrageous. Honestly, it's like she, she hopes that everyone has amnesia from nine years of failure. Well, we remember, we remember, Senator Rustin, what you did to the health care system in this country, and Minister Butler and this government are fixing it. We're fixing it bit by bit with workforce, with difficult decisions, with looking at where we can make investments, to looking at how we can fix primary care and ensure Thank that people you, in regional and rural Australia has have expired. A uh, Senator Little, second supplementary. Minister, another promise was to prioritise Australians' access to health care and protect Medicare. Given that promise, why has the Albanese Labor government slashed Medicare subsidised mental health support in half, removing access to psychology sessions from the Australians who need the most support? Why are you breaking promises on medicines, country doctors, Medicare and mental health? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. The question is wrong um, on all three issues. It is. It's wrong. But we, we get what you're doing. We get what you're doing. Okay. You ask incorrect questions and then I get to answer them, which is what I'm doing now. But we are the party of Medicare. We are the party that built Medicare. We are the party that will save it. We are the party that will make investments in, in health care. We will make medicines cheaper. We will have new models of care like urgent care centres. Are you opposed to those Order. as well? Is the coalition opposed to those as well? We will make it easier to bring in workforce that we so desperately need in this country that you had failed to do, that left to millions waiting, uh, uh, visas waiting to come into the country. The backlog we're fixing to try and ensure Senator that Rustin. the people that Senator Little raises, the people living in rural and regional Australia, actually get the health care they deserve because it declined so badly under your watch. Thank That's exactly you, Minister. What your doing. time has expired. Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. If everybody could leave the chamber in a quiet fashion, that would be appreciated, please, by Hansard. I'm thinking of Hansard. I'm thinking of Hansard. Please, everybody, I'm being serious. Um, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy <laughs> President. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order Number 74, Part 5, which requires that uh, estimates questions on notice be answered within 30 days. I seek an exclamation from the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care as to why answers to 13 questions um, uh, that have not been provided within the requisite days. And those 13 questions are SQ 22, numbers 366, 368, 531, 593, and SQ 23, questions number 1, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 18 and 19. Um, and I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's uh, failure. No. <laughs> oh, let the explanation. So, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. I um, acknowledge the notice that Senator Rustin gave. Um, uh, this, uh, so, on the issue at hand, the department has provided the advice that 358 questions in writing and on notice from uh, the estimates hearing held in October 2022. For those questions that were provided on time, the Department of Health provided on time responses to 94 per cent of the questions received. I can advise uh, the Senate that, although it's a different number to the one Senator Rustin just used, approximately 20 questions in writing arising from November estimates that are outstanding 
and the department advises that it's expected that these will be tabled by the end of the week. The Department of Health and Ageing has already received approximately 905 questions in writing um, already from those hearings, of which 300 of them come from one senator alone. So there are a lot of questions that the Department of Health are trying to answer in the relevant time. Um, there are no questions awaiting clearance um, through the minister's office. They've all been cleared, so we're just waiting to get those outstanding ones from the Department of Health. Senator Rustin. Move that the Senate take note um, of the minister's inability to actually provide an explanation as to why all of these questions have not been responded to within the statutory time frame. Senator Cash. Oh, sorry. So, um, look, thank you very much. And um, you know, it's interesting to note that, that the minister, in response to um, to this particular um, question, um, came in and, and listed the number of questions that have been put on notice to the department. Uh, well, you know, it is really quite extraordinary when you consider that there are a significant, uh, greater number of questions were put on notice by those opposite when they were in opposition. But I would also put on uh, on the record that the reason that these questions are put on notice is because um, um, time after time after time of asking for uh, for answers to questions, there is a failure by the department in estimates and often in this place to actually provide answers to those particular questions. Um, it's also interesting. Um, I did give notice to uh, the department and the agencies and the minister that was in, at, at estimates that I was seeking answers to these remaining questions because they are actually um, relate to a particular group of um, or set of questions that um, I think that the public has every right to have an answer to, and they're not particularly onerous questions in which to answer. I mean, one of the questions, as an example, as I simply asked for the overseas travel. Um, up until that particular point in time, which was actually um, into November 2022, so not a particularly long period of time uh, during this government's term, for the overseas travel by the five ministers within the health and aged care portfolio. As to why the department would still have that question, and it has not been, uh, in, as the, the minister uh, representing the minister for health and aged care has said that. Um, that none of the questions that have been unanswered are in the minister's office. I would, under, would not, could not quite understand why the department wouldn't be able to answer a question around the travel arrangements. One would have thought the minister's office might have been able to do that. Um, one of the more concerning of the questions that remains outstanding is um, for an amount of $312.6 million that has been allocated within the agency for ICT changes. I mean, $312.6 million uh, of a budget line item with no detail that we sought additional detail as to um, the details of expenditure of that kind of money and now some you know sort of five months later we still don't have any information about something that was contained in the October budget. So we're talking about um, a transparency around the expenditure of quite a significant amount of money. Um, the purpose of the estimates obviously is to get information around the expenditure of money but $312.6 million apparently is not sufficient to warrant responding to. Um, simple question around how many conferences uh, that the minister uh, has sent departmental officials to attend on their behalf. So how many times has the minister been asked or invited to attend conferences where departmental officials um, have, been, uh, have been sent to represent the minister? It does not strike me as something that would have been terribly difficult for the department to be able to answer, or for that matter, the minister's office, because of course, if the minister was invited and he sent the department, they would have had copies of those invitations. Um, and just a minute ago, we saw um, Senator Little ask a very serious question about cuts to mental health um, that have occurred under uh, this current government, uh, the Medicare-funded uh, Medicare rebates, um, subsidised rebates to people with serious mental health conditions, and uh, we didn't get one word about mental health, but. In these questions that we have not had answered, one of the issues was about the consultations that were undertaken prior to the decision to cut mental health. Um, another really, really serious um, question that was asked, we often hear those officers talk about the great things that they've done since coming into government in health. And one of them was a copycat policy, uh, which was a copycat of ours, around providing continuous glucose monitoring devices to people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, it was re received with great acclamation, and we've seen the minister and many of the assistant ministers running around heralding the, the great achievements of this. 
We ask questions about there appears to be a severe shortage about the provision of these devices to Australians with diabetes. This question was put on notice. We still don't have an answer. We do not know uh, what the shortages are. We do not know how many Australians are waiting for this life-changing um, devices to be made available to them, and yet we have this government running around telling Australia how fabulous they are because apparently they've fulfilled this promise, but they can't answer the question as to whether they really have or not. Uh, in relation to a number of questions on notice around a piece of legislation that was pushed through the parliament yesterday, where I asked a number of questions of two representing ministers um, about um, details that sit behind changes to um, private hospitals and the use of, um, of implantable devices. I raised these questions in November and I raised these questions in more detail in the February estimates. So for the government to have arrived in here yesterday with the bills before the chamber and still not be able to answer questions, questions that have been on notice for some period of time, once again just points to the fact that we have got a government that is absolutely prepared to push legislation through with no detail and refuse to answer the questions that have been uh, that are legitimately being asked by those on this side to make sure that we have transparency and that the, that, that the sectors that need to know the answer to these questions have them. So they're just some examples of the kinds of questions that are unnoticed that haven't been answered. They are not questions that would have required onerous amount of work by the department to provide the answers. They are reasonably simple questions that quite clearly, in the absence of an answer to those questions, you'd have to suggest that the government is either hiding something or they haven't done anything and they're not prepared to admit to that. So I would say that um, a government that had been elected on a platform of transparency, the opaqueness and refusal to provide details about things that are tremendously important um, would suggest that, that, once again, their guarantee of a transparent government was nothing more than every other promise that they have made, and that was a headline promise that they never had any intention of ever delivering. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. Uh Deputy President, and I also rise to take note of the minister's answer, um, or rather excuses, uh, as Senator Rustin has outlined as to why questions that have been placed on the notice paper, and as we know, uh, senators are entitled to place questions on the notice paper and expect a response uh, within the allocated time of 30 days, have not yet been provided. But the point that Minister Rustin makes is actually the point that the Senate does need to take note of. When you look at the platform that Mr Albanese went to the Australian people on, which was all one about integrity, integrity uh, and transparency. In fact, prior to the election, he was very vocal, very vocal when he made announcements to the Australian people that if elected, both he as the Prime Minister and his ministers as part of the Albanese government, they would deliver transparency, integrity and accountability in everything we do. But as we know, all talk, all talk before the election, just like so many of the promises that they made to the Australian people, and we can go through them shortly, what you now have is broken promises from a tricky government. And this is a government that prior to the election talks big on integrity, accountability and transparency, and yet, once elected to office, fails to actually hold itself to the standards that it set for itself prior to the election. Now, Senator Rustin has raised an issue with the minister today in relation to questions in the health portfolio that have not yet been answered. I myself, prior to question time today, had raised with Senator Watt, as the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Burke, that I too would be raising this in relation to my portfolio after question time. Uh, I had 155 questions uh, that had been asked in January of this year that were due to be tabled on the 9th of February 2023 that were still outstanding. Now, lo and behold, just before question time was finalised today, Minister Burke tabled the answers to the questions. Now, interestingly, I thought that I would be sent by my office 155 answers. One would expect 155 questions. One might then say 155 answers. Can you my surprise, colleagues, when I was given one piece of paper, 
One piece of paper. So much for integrity, transparency and accountability. One piece of paper. Question number 1162 to 1317. There's quite a jump in between, let me assure you. Question date, the 10th of January 2023. Table office due date, the 9th of February 2023. Just before question time today, after the minister has been notified that I too would be taking note of a failure by the minister to uphold the standards that Mr Albanese told the Australian people uh, both he and his ministers uh, would be implementing when, if and when they are elected to government, uh, transparency, integrity and account accountability, I suddenly get one page. It is a global answer to 155 questions, but it does inform me—and this is the good news, colleagues. The Office of the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations and the Department have undertaken a review of my questions on notice 1162 to 1317. So at least a step in the right direction. They obviously opened the file that was sent to them and they at least reviewed them. And then quite literally, as part of administering the workplace relations system, the Minister of the Minister's Office and the Department met with employee and employer representatives, for example, to consult on policy development. This is the beauty of the answer, though. Contact with some of the named representatives may have occurred in this context. Well, may have. Well, what, what, what does may have mean, in particular for a government that, again prior to the election, expounded virtues when it came to integrity, transparency and accountability? So what you have is, quite frankly, contempt for the Australian Senate. And that is not just me talking. I do reflect on comments that were made by those that are now in government when they were in opposition. And in particular, I have to say the now Attorney General of Australia, Mark Dreyfus, someone who is a great preacher, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, acting deputy president, that he is a practiser, but he does like preaching, as so many have stated, in relation to accountability and integrity. In fact, Mr Dreyfus proudly told the Office of the Information Commissioner in a speech on Right to Know Day last year. This is very interesting. Information held by government and public institutions is a public resource. I'm assuming that he thought that was a complete, total and utter joke. He also said a culture of transparency within government is everyone's responsibility. Perhaps what he should have done, though, was put in brackets except for the following ministers, and in this case, uh, Minister Burke, who again, 155 questions on notice, 155 questions outstanding uh, as at the 8th of March, and then prior to question time, a one-page answer in relation to all of these questions. But also, Mr Dreyfus clearly are not worried about practising what he preaches, said this appropriate, prompt and proactive disclosure of government-held information informs community, increases participation and enhances decision-making, builds trust and confidence, is required and permitted by law and improves efficiency. So, again, I'm a little confused. What part of treating the Senate with contempt by providing a one-page answer to 155 questions well after the 30-day time period has expired actually fits within appropriate? Absolutely not. Prompt? Definitely not. Proactive disclosure? Well, absolutely not there. Um, informs community? Well, one page doesn't inform us of much. Increases participation and enhances decision making, builds trust and confidence, and is required and permitted by law, and improves efficiency. Well, the answers that I have been provided with, or rather one page answer, clearly does not do any of that. But then again, now they are in government, those on the other side are clearly holding themselves to very, very different standards um, to what they actually preached 
prior to the election. And if I actually look at what now Minister Watt said in June 2021, just over 20 months ago, uh, and this was in relation to a failure to provide answers to questions on notice in a timely fashion, and those on the other side, they are also entitled to raise this when we are in government. But the problem is they have then got to actually look at the answers they gave when they were in opposition and judge themselves and hold themselves to the standards that they screamed at the other side were required when we were in government. This is what Minister Watt now said. We deserve answers and transparency. He went even further and said it is not negotiable and it should not be negotiable to comply with the standing orders and properly answer those questions. Well, perhaps Minister Watt, on behalf of senators in this place, may actually raise that with both the Prime Minister and Minister Burke in terms of the way they have responded to the questions that I had on notice, and certainly in the way that Senator Rustin's questions have not been answered, despite, again, the standards by which Mr Albanese said his government would be judged if and, in due course, they were elected. Other, others on the other side have also, though, and again, sometimes you actually need to read what you preached when you were in opposition uh, to ensure that you are practising it when in government. Senator Mario Smith said on the 15th of October 2019, I am relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. It's not an unreasonable request, Senator Smith. Um, Senator Sheldon, on the 15th of October 2019, said, when you answer the questions, it drives results and it drives accountability. This is what this parliament is for. And then I have to say, with all due respect to poor Senator Giacconi, on the 3rd of December 2019, Senator Giacconi, I will have to remind you, I will have to remind you uh, of what you stated, but I'm sure you impress upon this. I'm sure you impress upon your ministers this. It is a fundamental responsibility of this place to hold any government of the day to account. The Australian community expect us as senators to ask these very questions. These questions need to be asked for any Minister of the Crown to simply ignore this place. To disrespect the Senate and, through it, the Australian community is very much unacceptable. And I have to say it was very well said, Senator Kiney, very well said. Order. It is just a shame Order. that both the Prime Minister of Australia and, in my case, Minister Burke, uh, have not actually listened to what are your very, very wise words. So, Mr President, or Mr Acting Deputy President, um, as Senator Rustin has clearly articulated, uh, as is evident from what those on the other side said when they were in opposition, and certainly by the actions of the now Albanese government ministers, but in particular the Prime Minister himself, they set themselves the standards of being a government that would have integrity, be transparent with both the Senate and the other place and the Australian people, and certainly provide accountability. And yet, day after day after day, and we haven't even reached the first year anniversary of the election, all we in this Senate and the Australian people are seeing is a government that doesn't really care what it said prior to the election, a government that, once elected, turns its back on the promises that it made, a government that fails to hold itself to the standards it set, and quite frankly, is a government that is just full of broken promises. Senator Bragg. Uh, acting Deputy President, and I rise to take note of the failure to answer questions. And it is a systemic problem, I think, across this government. There are basically three mechanisms where we can get transparency on key issues for the Australian people. Now, we have the questions on notice processes, which Senator Cash has already detailed, has not been respected by the government. Uh, then there are the orders for production of documents, which I must, uh, I must say are also have been regularly ignored. And then there's, of course, the mechanism of freedom of information, which is available to any citizen. And what you often see from this government is a tendency to merge a freedom of information request lodged by a, a citizen uh, who may also be a senator at the same time 
uh, with a question or notice or with a order for production of documents. Now, of course, these things are not supposed to merge. They are supposed to be treated separately, but we see a deliberate uh, corruption of these processes across the board. And by using that term, I don't mean to say that people are corrupt, but I mean to say that the, that the process is often corrupted in the sense that it is not respected for what it should be. Now, I have lodged, for better, for better or worse, many questions on notice through the uh, Senator Gallagher's office uh, on behalf of Mr. Minister Jones. Now, um, these things range from detailed questions on financial advice policy, superannuation policy, uh, matters to do with the uh, Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Now, the government is now sitting on a, a key test in relation to these matters because after yesterday's motion on this report into the ASIC deputy chair, uh, the government will have to decide, uh, is it going to release a report that the Senate voted overwhelmingly for the government to release? Now, we haven't called on the Securities and Investments Commission to make the report public. We've called on the government through the Treasury and the Treasurer to deliver that report. And it, it will be up to the Treasurer now to comply with that order. And I would say that it would be very risky territory now for the Treasurer to hide behind uh, some strange reasoning uh, not to release a report, which has cost taxpayers $200,000. Taxpayers have forked out $200,000 for a secret investigation into an ASIC commissioner, which was covered up by ASIC, or tended to be covered up by ASIC at Senate estimates. And fancy that, the corporate regulator, the organisation which is required to hold Australian companies to account, is covering up an investigation into one of its own. Now, is there any wonder why corporate Australia regularly breaks the laws we said here in Canberra, that corporate Australia doesn't take ASIC seriously, that ASIC's reputation is in the toilet, and that people don't fear ASIC. And we see a repeat of lawlessness, and then we see royal commissions which make recommendations which are ignored. And one of the core problems here is that the law enforcement agencies are not doing their jobs, and then the government of the day seeks to cover it up. Now, this is going to be a key test. And all of the questions that have been asked, almost all the questions that have been asked in the Treasury portfolio since the election have not been answered properly. And I refer here to questions on notice uh, 356, where I asked how many meetings has the minister, this is Minister Jones, had with stakeholders in his review of the best financial interest duty which the Treasury is conducting? And no answer. And then Question on notice number 565, where I asked again the same minister, Minister Jones, is the minister aware of disclosures made by Australian Super on Wednesday 14 September 2022 in their annual members meeting notice? Now, in that meeting notice, uh, because uh, regulations had been made by the government, uh, the, that super fund was able to cover up over $100 million in related party transactions and $1 million in payments to unions. I asked subsequent questions to the minister. Was the minister aware of these uh, huge, uh, uh, huge, huge uh, covers up of key information? And again, no answers. So it is a very regrettable situation that the government is taking policy judgments or making policy judgments to do certain things. They're asked about them in the usual way through the, the means we have here in the chamber and through questions on notice. And the government is deciding not to provide that information. And that is showing that the government holds the chamber in contempt. And it is a pattern, as I say, it is a pattern of behaviour where all the transparency measures are treated so poorly by the government. Now, there was a long and twisted debate about the creation of an integrity commission, which I personally have favoured the establishment of for many years. A lot of the people who made the, the argument to have an integrity commission made the argument as if there were no other integrity measures or there were no other transparency measures as part of our system of government. Now, one of the great things about our system of government is that we have the committee system, we have Senate estimates, we have these transparency measures, and if they're not treated poorly, they will be eroded over time. 
So therefore, the creation of an integrity commission will have less power or less capacity to improve our system over the long run if the other measures are watered down. So it is. It, it does take. I mean, a, a government needs to respect the institutions that it inherits over time, and the failure to address questions that are asked through proper means and methods uh, is hugely regrettable. And always pointing the finger at past practices is not a very good answer. And I'm sure that there have been cases in the past where governments have not answered questions properly, and I think think that is hugely regrettable. Uh, governments who want to preach to the electorate that they are going to be the paragon of virtue and the paragon of integrity uh, should, of course, hold themselves to that standard. I think that is only reasonable that that's what an opposition would seek a government to do. That if we are asking reasonable questions in accordance with the rules, that they would be answered within the timetable, or at least the substance of the answers be given uh, rather than fobbed off. So I have to say that it, is, it, it, it concerns me that answers aren't given, but it also concerns me that when answers are given, they're not actually given. But the greatest concern I have here is the meshing together of the processes which aren't supposed to be meshed together. If I ask a question on notice to the minister, I'm not supposed to get an answer back saying, oh, we've, we've got an FOI from you. You're supposed to actually treat them as if they are not intersecting with one another. So uh, regularly we're receiving correspondence back uh, from ministers saying, we have your FOI, even though you've asked a question on notice now. Of course, I've asked the FOI as citizen brag, not a senator brag, so um, I would, wouldn't expect those things would uh, overlap. So uh, we hope that the government can do better here because it's an important part of the institution which we don't want to see eroded over time. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator O'Sullivan. Yeah, thank you. I will associate myself with uh, my colleagues that have, that have stood up uh, and made a contribution on this issue. It's, uh, of course, a very important issue of, of transparency. We heard uh, right throughout the election campaign, and indeed, I was elected in 2019, and almost uh, every question time, the, this particular topic of uh, transparency and integrity was raised, and it was something that uh, the Albanese government, uh, or the opposition then, took to the Australian people, saying that this is uh, what they're going to do, that they're going to be the new measure, that they're going to be the new measure of transparency that Australians can expect. And what we're seeing, a pattern that's been developed here now over, over nearly 12 months, where there's been a complete avoidance of, of transparency and when the opportunity to, uh, to be upfront, to be transparent, uh, it, uh, that we're not seeing this government take that seriously. And uh, so I, I associate everything uh, myself with uh, everything that Senator Rustin, um, Senator Cash, Senator Bragg uh, have, have said. Uh, and I thought it was quite interesting that in the contribution that Senator Cash made that uh, she reflected on some of the comments that uh, my colleagues on the other side, when they were on this side, were making uh, in the last term. And uh, she, uh, Senator Cash, referenced a statement that uh, my good friend uh, Senator Sheldon made, uh, where he said that uh, when, when questions are answered, there's, there's progress, or worse to that effect, uh, things happen. And, and he's absolutely right. And what we need to see is this government start to take their responsibilities more seriously, and, or at least, at the very least, take this chamber and the processes as Senator Bragg was speaking about. Uh, more seriously and, and understand the importance of their role in ensuring good accountability and good government. Uh, and some of the questions, I was just going through some of the questions that uh, Senator Rustin is, is waiting on, questions that, that she's put to, to, the, the, to the Minister for Health in relation to you know, various issues of the health portfolio. I mean, they, some of these questions are hardly gotcha questions. Like they're, not, they're not there to just trip the government up. Some of them relate to very serious issues that many Australians are facing. Now, I remember uh, about 12 months ago, or just, just over, uh, I had uh, someone come into my office and was a father of a, a child that has juvenile diabetes. And this father, Jeff, his name was, he explained to me that, uh, that for a child who has a continuous glucose monitoring device, that the worst day of their lives is actually their 21st birthday. Because on their 21st birthday, 
uh, they lose the they were going to lose the the access to that glucose monitoring device uh, because it was no longer going to be covered under the PBS or under under Medicare, and uh, because as an adult they, they weren't afforded. Now we uh, and many of my colleagues were would have been approached by similar uh, stories uh, in their uh, in their electorate offices as people came forward, and there was a quite an active campaign to convince the government of the day that uh, that. that Ensuring that adults got access to those uh, those devices uh, was was important, and we uh, I remember engaging with the minister for health and the and through the election campaign, uh, the health minister, then health minister, uh, Greg Hunt, made uh, a commitment on behalf of the Australian government that should the coalition be elected, uh, they would provide those services to and provide those devices to adults and. Thankfully, the Labor Party matched that commitment. They matched that commitment. And so here we have a question that goes to, you know, what are you doing? You said you would do it. You said it was part of your election commitment. You jumped on the Me Too bandwagon. That's right, Senator, Senator Hughes. Uh, they jumped straight on it. Now, good. That we, we applauded the fact that there was unanimity on, on this issue, and, and Australians were, were very, very grateful for that. So here's a question. It's not a gotcha question. It's just a very straightforward question about the implementation of that change, about the implementation of that program. You know, uh, how many additional devices are estimated to be required to meet the demand? Pretty, pretty basic question. Not, not, nothing there to trip the government up. Uh, how many patients are waiting to access a device? Pretty straightforward. Is there a shortage of continuous glucose monitoring devices for type 1 diabetic patients? Again. Pretty straightforward. Uh, how is the department triaging which patients have access to a device? My point is that not only is it important to ensure that uh, we have transparency, to ensure the integrity of the government uh, is, is intact uh, and the, respecting the process, as Senator Bragg was talking about, and being able to ask these questions and have them respond in a timely fashion, it actually goes to you know, very serious issues, like Senator Sheldon was saying. If we want to see progress, then we've got to see answers to these questions. We've got to see answers to these questions. So that's why we ask these questions. That's why these questions are there. And, and expecting a response is important. And having those responses come in a timely fashion is critical because it actually impacts people's lives. It's disappointing that families look to a 21st birthday is actually the biggest disappointment. I mean, most people look to their 21st birthday and it's a big celebration. But for sadly too many people, when, you know, as they're becoming adults and progressing through their life, if, they, if they've got type 1 diabetes and they, they're going to lose access to that machine, uh, to that device, it's going to obviously have a dramatic impact on their well-being, on, on their health. And so that's what this is about. It's, it's, it's more than just transparency. It's more than just integrity. It's about people's lives. And I urge this government to take their job seriously. You weren't just elected to have a, hold a position. You were elected to, to lead. You were elected to actually deliver the services that Australia, Australians expect you to deliver and that good taxpayers are paying for the delivery of those services. So I implore you, take this job seriously. Don't treat us with contempt. Don't treat this place, this Senate, with contempt. Because you all, you, you, you're not just working against the institution, you're actually working against the Australian people who expect more and expect you to stand up for them. Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Well, I think we're now moving to taking note. Is that you, Senator? Hughes. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to take note of uh, questions asked by, to Senator Gallagher by Senator Payne, <coughs> Senator Gallagher by Senator Chandler, Senator Davey to Senator Gallagher and Senator Little to Senator Gallagher. Um, we once again heard today from the government that they were going to make a modest change to superannuation. They didn't understand why everyone's knickers were getting in a twist because it's a modest change. And I thought, well, we keep hearing this. It's obviously been featured throughout the focus groups that they've been conducting and how to best sell uh, these broken promises to the electorate because 
Before the election, you didn't say modest change. Mr Albanese said no change, very clearly, no change. And so I had a look at what the word modest means, the dictionary, because I felt it might be helpful for those opposite to understand that modest means relatively small, moderate or limited. And then if you look up what no means, when you talk about no change to superannuation, no change to franking credits, no means not at all, not any, to no extent. So what we have those from those opposite is a litany, a litany of broken promises, one after the other. And superannuation, one that is attacking the retirement savings of people's investments that have made long-term strategies that we now know is not going to impact 0.5 per cent of Australians. It's going to impact 10 per cent of Australians because their broken promises continue. They're also going to stop allowing companies from offering franking credits. Now, we all remember the election when Chris Bowen said, if you don't like uh, the Senator policy, Hughes, don't vote I remind for us. So to, Senator Hughes, I remind you to refer to others uh, in the other place by their correct title. Uh, really should have written down what member of the seat he is, but Mr Bowen, uh, he uh, said, if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. And the Australian electorate very kindly took his advice and chose not to vote for those opposite uh, and ended Bill Shorten's long-held ambition uh, to be Senator Prime Minister. Hughes, once again, I remind you to refer to people ambition to become Prime Minister, which I understand has not faded. Uh, however, he may have to deal with the member of Sydney, who apparently has the support of all her colleagues. Uh, but Minister Bowen, uh, as he said back then as the member, don't, vote, don't like the policy, don't vote for us. So the lesson that was learnt by the Labor Party was don't tell the electorate. Don't tell them the policies to let them make a decision on whether or not they vote for you. Your decision was, we just won't tell them the policies. We will just say, as, as Senator O'Sullivan was just saying, you jumped on the Me Too movement. Every time you saw a policy that came out from the college, oh, but that's us too. Don't worry, we're a safe pair of hands. Dr Chalmers doing the work on his PhD, saying he absolutely looks up to Paul Keating, the former Prime Minister, and his and Prime Minister Hawke's their attempts to make sure the Australian economy modernised. But as soon as Dr Chalmers has got in, he's unwinding all of those economic gains, taking the Labor Party back to the good old days of left-wing socialism, redistribution of wealth. But they knew if they told the Australian electorate that, they weren't going to like it. They weren't going to back your superannuation changes. They weren't going to support you on changes to franking credits. But what we do want to find out, and the funny, you know, again, as was just said by Senator Sullivan, some of the questions that are being asked are really quite serious questions that are just about the policy detail. How are everyday Australians going to be affected by this? So a really reasonable question about how is unrealised gains going to be taxed? Self-managed super farms. You've got a farm, it's worth $2 million in the, in the self-managed super fund, you get a couple of land values increase. All of a sudden, you, your farm's valued at over $3 million one year. It's not a realised asset. It's not sold. It's still part of the family fund. We cannot get an answer about what sort of modelling was done, how many families are going to be impacted. Actually, we ask where else in the world has this ever been implemented and successfully implemented and had a positive impact. The only place I think we can find is one African country which had its economy collapse. So that's a really great model for those opposite to be uh, trying to, to copy. But these are simple questions and it either just shows you're continuing to lie to the Australian people, breaking promises, or you simply just don't know the answers. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. President, thank you for the opportunity of being able to make a contribution to this debate. Well, can I just remind those listening and those on the opposition benches that they were in government for almost a decade. And when they left government, one has to ask, why were they booted out? The Australian people lost confidence in them. Why? 
because of the rotting, the dysfunction of uh, the government, the mismanagement. And when the good senator asked questions today, the question in relation to health and access to GPs, one has to remember that the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, had such little faith in his health minister that he actually took control of the health portfolio as well as being Prime Minister and four other ministries. So that's how dysfunctional that government was. But you cannot accept, and the Australian people understand this, you cannot accept that a new government coming in, and I think we're a very good government, but even we can't fix the mess that was left behind by those opposite for the last decade. Now, we all know, and from my home state of Tasmania, we know only too well the crisis in health there that's been left. <clears throat> Lack of access to GPs, hospitals that are under enormous stress. We know that the ambulances and the good senator from Tasmania here understands that the Royal Hobart Hospital and the Launceston General Hospital and in Burnie and other hospitals, the ramping uh, and the issues facing our health system uh, is really chronic. Now, we're the ones, whenever we've been in government, it's been a Labor government that has built the nation when it comes to skills. We've built the nation around Medicare and ensuring people have access to their GPs. We invest in mental health. We invest in housing. We are very aware of the homeless crisis in this country. And then we've got the opposition who now, they want us to just rewrite history and forget about the trillion dollar debt that they left the Australian community, and we're the government who now has to manage that debt, we have to begin to start paying that down. So what we've introduced is a very, very modest, modest change to superannuation. So what we've got is those people all this week they've come in at every question time and taking note, bleating about the impact that's going to have on people who have $3 million plus in their superannuation. That they are still going to get a concession, but not as great a concession as the rest of the people. And let's face it, most Australians, most Australians have a balance of $120,000 in their superannuation fund. So I look at it and say, we've got a trillion dollar debt on this hand. We're going to have to pay it down there. The Australian taxpayer, Australians are going to have to pay this. So a modest impact on those who have, as I said, $3 million plus in their superannuation, which is going to affect 0.5 per cent of, of the Australian taxation and those who have superannuation, is very modest. But indeed, it, it is, just seems to me it's just another attempt by those opposite, the no coalition, who it doesn't matter what this government will put forward, they're not going to support it. They talk about homelessness, they talk about health, but when it comes to addressing those issues, like providing a housing future fund so we can supply and assist people to get into affordable housing, particularly when it comes to women and children, what do we get from the Liberal Coalition? No, they won't support it. They won't support it. So don't come into the chamber, as I said, rewriting history, bleating about your concerns, when, when you're in government, again, if we look at skills and training and manufacturing, you let all of those companies go offshore. The only way you're going to provide uh, manufacturing in this country is to support TAFE system. That's why we've introduced 180,000 fee free TAFE Thank you, places. Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Little. Thank you. Well, Labor is really all talk and no action. Labor said they were going to strengthen Medicare, but so far they have only weakened our health system. They've slashed Medicare mental health support in half. They've cut 70 telehealth items, cut hospital funding in the budget, 
And bulk billing? Well, that's plummeting. This is particularly concerning for rural and regional Australia, and in South Australia, my state, where we know workforce shortages are hitting the hardest, and this government has only made it worse. They have ripped doctors out of country towns through their changes to the distribution priority areas for overseas trained doctors. I hear it in South Australia. And now they are relegating international doctors and nurses working in regional Australia to the bottom of the visa pile by failing to prioritise 887 regional skilled visas. On the eve of the election, the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, promised Australians that an elected Labor government would have 50 urgent care clinics up and running within the first 12 months. But it's clear they have broken this promise too, as they cannot even confirm whether one clinic will be up and running by July, let alone, blown, along with 50 promises across the country. Labor went to the election with a promise to reduce the cost of medicines, but now the Albanese Labor government has decided to remove an innovative, life-changing form of insulin, FIAS, from the PBS, sending the price soaring to unaffordable levels for the 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on it. Now let's talk about mental health access. As part of our response to support Australians in tough times, the former coalition government doubled the number of Medicare subsidised psychology sessions available through the Better Access Initiative from 10 to 20. Given the significant pressures that Australians are facing right now with the cost of living and energy bills skyrocketing, mental health support could not be more important. But despite these pressures still impacting our communities, the Labor government has decided that now is the right time to slash access to psychology sessions in half. Serious mental health issues are often at their highest two or three years after a crisis, pandemic or natural disaster, which is why it is absolutely vital that vulnerable Australians have continued access to the psychology sessions they need. The independent evaluation of the Better Access Initiative even recommended that the additional 10 sessions should continue to be made available and should be targeted towards those with complex mental health needs. This government needs to stop their irresponsible attacks on the mental health services Australians are relying on and explain why they have gone against recommendation 12 of the review and the needs of vulnerable Australians by cutting this support. That is why the coalition has organised a petition calling on the government to urgently reinstate these critical Medicare subsidised psychology sessions until such time as they put in place an alternative to ensure adequate access to mental health support for all Australians who need it. Talking about the broken promises, before the election, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer made many promises. Remember the promise to cut your electricity bill by $275? Broken. Remember the promises of cheaper mortgages? Broken. Remember the promise of no changes to super? Also broken. Remember the promise of lower inflation? Well, that's definitely broken. Remember the promise that we're not touching franking credits? Broken. Remember the promise that industry-wide bargaining is not part of our policy? Definitely broken. Remember the promise that we will be doing our bit to assist real wage increases? Hmm, broken. Remember the promise that we are not about raising taxes? Hmm. Broken too. Remember the promise to cut the cost of consultants and contractors? Hmm. Broken. Look forward to seeing just how broken that one is. These are all broken promises from what is a tricky government and just goes to prove that on promises you just can't trust the Albanese government. Thanks, Senator Little. Senator Ciccone. Thanks a lot, President. And uh, unfortunately, I can tell you what's broken is that the, the coalition continues, continues in their persistence of undermining the working people of this country. They are a broken record. That is what is broken. Those opposite. And the reason why that they don't want to talk about the benefits of the superannuation scheme is because those opposite 
are embarrassed about the $1 trillion that they racked up when they were last in government not too long ago. They racked up $1 trillion and not put forward any solutions about how this government fixes the structural deficit that we have inherited and we are now trying to fix. But yet they come into this place and instead defending the workers of the country, are defending the 0.5 per cent of people who are very well off and who can afford to pay a bit more tax in order for us to fix the budget structural deficit that we have inherited. So before they come in here and accuse us of trying to break any promises, I think you should look at yourselves first about the mess that you have left us. The mess that you have left us and that the majority of Australians have actually said yes to. Two thirds of Australians in the latest new poll actually agree with the government's position of fixing the budget bottom line. In fact, the majority of coalition voters have actually agreed with the Labor Party's policy that we have recently announced. So it is extraordinary to see the coalition continue to attack the government's steps to repair the budget. The government is making modest changes. It is making modest changes, but allowing the very wealthy to still receive a tax concession. The only difference is instead of paying 15 per cent, they'll pay 30 per cent. And these are people that would be paying around 45 per cent on their income tax. So they are still much better off. But unfortunately, governments have to make these tough decisions to fix the, the, the budget bottom line. Now, it was Labor that did build this system of superannuation back in the 80s under Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, and will always continue to protect it and make sure that we protect it so it is stronger and it is sustainable into the future for working people. So that they, when they retire, the workers, the family of these workers can have a retirement that is comfortable and they are not reliant on government in the future. That was the whole point of setting up the superannuation scheme as part of the accord with industry, with business, with the governments and with the unions. But also it's important to remember that it was those opposite in the last government, many backbenchers, some of them in this place today, that were opposed to the super guarantee, opposed to the guarantee increasing from 9.5% further opposition around those 0.5 per cent incremental increases. Yes, hello, Senator Rennick. I do know your opposition to that. But it was a number of Liberal and national senators and members in the other place, President, that were opposed to super guarantee increases and today remain opposed to superannuation even existing. So since coming to government, we have been upfront about the challenges about the economy and the budget. We've inherited a trillion dollars and the $50 billion structural deficit that we are now trying to fix. Now, this is about responsible budget management, and the government has to make these choices so that we can continue to invest in defence, in health, in aged care and the NDIS. But it is really something about the coalition priorities that has got me today. And I want to place on the record in the last minute that I have about a speech that former Assistant Treasurer Senator Rod Kemp gave in a speech in Brisbane on the 20th of May 1999, entitled The Government's Approach to Super. Now, in his speech, he said, and I quote, On coming to government, it was clear that the existing tax concessions for superannuation were unfairly skewed to high income earners. To address this inequity, the government, that is the Howard government, introduced the superannuation surcharge. While this measure has been criticised by some, there is no question that it meets the equity objective, nor have I heard any justification of why high income earners should have continued to receive the disproportionately large tax advantages that were available before the introduction of the surcharge. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And, uh, I'm glad Senator Giacconi uh, quoted uh, former uh, Assistant Treasurer Rod Kemp. He didn't really have to go back that far because I've said that all along, ever since I got into this chamber, that superannuation is a rort uh, and it was only a matter of time before Labor would try and get their hands on the money. 
but we should also, given that it is International Women's Day, just talk about how inequitable superannuation really is for women. If we actually look at the mean balance uh, of superannuation for women uh, aged 60 to 64, their balance is uh, the mean balance is 280,000, whereas for men it's 360,000, uh, and so there's about a 30% higher uh, mean balance for people when they retire for men than there are for women. So what better way on International Women's Day to decide to abolish super and let women keep their superannuation so they can own a house? So they can own a house. Because at the end of the day, you know, if, if you've you know, got a, a man and woman in a house, they share it 50 per cent. So what, what better way uh, of, of sharing um, the debt than that? But uh, I, I would also like to uh, just follow up on uh, Senator Little's uh, questions, which I thought were very relevant. Uh, and I uh, commented on this earlier this week about the Labor Party abolishing the PBS uh, uh, subsidy for the 15,000 people with diabetes. So I find it incredible that you would uh, make it harder for these people to abolish a, uh, a drug that actually does work. Uh, I note that the Labor Party uh, continues to push uh, a fifth a a shot of the vaccine uh, that you know, hasn't stopped transmission or infection. Uh, so maybe they should actually stop spending money on vaccines that don't work and actually put it back into measures for mental health and for diabetes, which, mind you, has up uh, by 10 per cent uh, since the rollout of the COVID vaccine, which isn't surprising because uh, diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And as we know, the vaccine induces an autoimmune response. So surprise, surprise, are we surprised that we actually get uh, an increase in diabetes? No, we aren't, if I can answer my own rhetorical question. And I'd also like to pick up on Senator Giacconi's claim that we've actually got a trillion dollars in debt. We don't actually have a trillion dollars in debt. Uh, I just looked up just then on the Australian Office of Financial Management, and we're currently at 900 billion. But can I say that a lot of that debt was incurred throughout COVID in response to the uh, hysteria driven by Labor premiers who got up there every day, day after day, one at nine o'clock, one at 10 o'clock, one at 11 o'clock, giving us all the COVID cases. And when there weren't COVID cases, uh, they'd tell us that there was COVID in the sewerage. And then when we'd go for three months without COVID, we'd get one case and we'd shut down the entire state over one case. Uh, and then finally, when COVID did break out last year, we were told not to go to the hospital, but rather, if you had the case of COVID, uh, but to actually stay at home and take Panadol. So after all the hoo-ha about being told how we had to shut down and lock down and how we, the federal government was you know, basically blackmailed into throwing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars at the state governments who were just generating fear, that was the real pandemic fear, uh, you know, we found out in the end that hospitals still weren't ready uh, and they're still not ready today, mind you. Our, our ambulance uh, waiting times are through the roof. Uh, the hospital, uh, the ambulance ramping is out of control. Uh, we've got waiting lists, record waiting lists across all the states who, of course, overinvested in hysteria and didn't actually invest in good, solid, long-term health infrastructure like beds, like more doctors, uh, like nurses, uh, and actually put the money into actually putting more money on the front line for services instead of fear-mongering. But of course, that is what we get with this side of the government. And uh, just back to some of this original super stuff. Now, personally, I've always been on the record as saying superannuation is a tax rort and it does favour the wealthy. But can I say that this new rule, this proposed rule that we're going to tax unrealised gains is totally unworkable. And I'm not saying that as a politician. I'm saying that who spent 30 years in finance uh, reconciling balance sheets. And I can assure you that if you think you're going to be able to, to calculate unrealised gains on any equitable manner, you are kidding yourself. Because what it's going to do is you're going to add compliance costs. So you're going to have to pay for an auditor or an evaluator to actually value these assets. Then you're going to actually have liquidity problems because you're going to have to sell an asset to actually pay the tax. Uh, and then the third problem is you're going to generate uncertainty because people aren't going to know what the value of that asset will deem to be before June 30. So I would ask that you at least reconsider that unrealised gain Thank you, proposition Senator because Rennick, it's your time unworkable. Has expired. Senator Thorpe, were you seeking the call? Thank you, President. I oh, beg your pardon. Let me just put the question first. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Hughes be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, 
say no. Senator Thorpe, the, no, the ayes have it. Thank you, President. I rise to take note of uh, Minister Watts' answers uh, today in question time relating to Aboriginal deaths in custody. As you will know, our people have never stopped calling on the government to fully implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. I do thank Senator Dodson for echoing our calls for action in this space, and we will keep the pressure on day by day until we finally see action. You don't need to go out looking for new solutions. The solutions have been there for over 30 years. They've been sitting on government shelf collecting dust whilst our people still continue to die at the hands of the system. Today I asked a simple question requiring a yes or no answer if the government will implement the recommendations in full and Senator Watt failed to answer that simple question. He also failed to answer how the government is going to respond to their own special envoy's requests for action. I appreciate that some steps are being taken on deaths in custody by this government, but in many other areas we have seen the federal government's continuously palm off responsibility on deaths in custody to the states and territories. The federal government needs to finally lead the way in this space to make sure all recommendations are implemented in full. We need urgent action today. Every death in custody is one too many. Deaths in custody are preventable. Families and communities are always in a state of mourning from this ongoing torture in the Australian prison system against First Nations people. One simple action for this government to take is to get Medicare and PBS into the prison systems in this country. You wonder why people are dying in custody. They don't get medical attention in the way that they need to. They don't have Medicare in prisons. This will benefit everybody. This will allow better healthcare services and wider medications available to those incarcerated. This will also allow for early detection of diseases and allow their prevention. For imprisoned First Nations people, it would mean access to culturally safe community health services and Aboriginal health checks. It would also mean that a continuation of care is possible after the release from prison, which would prevent a lot of health challenges for our people experienced during that time. It would also mean access to much needed mental health services. Medicare in prisons is theoretically a labour policy, but we never have seen any effort to actually make it happen. Well, it's time to do so. Another obvious step to take is to review the implementation of the 339 recommendations that are on someone's shelf, dusty, from 32 years ago. Uh, the last review was handed down in 2018 by Deloitte and has been widely dismissed by experts due to the dodgy desktop analysis that they took. They didn't even talk to the people. They sat at the computer and done an analysis and said, oh yeah, this recommendation looks like it's okay. We'll just say that that one's been implemented. So it was a dodgy desktop review. We need our people to be part of this solution. This government needs to conduct a real independent review of where the implementation of the recommendations is at and take urgent action to save black lives in this country. You've once again have blood on your hands, Labor, because you had the opportunity last time you were in government to implement these recommendations. Now, 10 years later, you're back and we're sick of the rhetoric, we're sick of the all talk and no action. 
Even your own special envoy, your voice in your party, is asking you to implement the recommendations because he was one of the commissioners at the time. So at least listen to your own voice if you want us to listen Thank to you, this Senator other Thorpe, one. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to notices of motion.